This is addressing the place of African American English or AAE as a dialect meriting inclusion in the TESOL classroom and TESOL curriculum. So due to the highly polarized racial climate of the United States, um, it sparked considerate debate among linguists surrounding which sort of English should be taught to native speakers of other languages. And due to the rising influence of English as a lingua franca, more students than ever before are choosing to travel to English speaking countries to develop their fluency. Well, approximately 70% of English speakers are using standard American English. Um, and so this sparks debate of what constitutes American English. So when learning American English, we should recognize that 12% of American English speakers are also speakers of African American English. And English learners who choose to learn standard American English may quickly find that there are many dialects, accents, vernaculars, nuances, and varieties of English. And which, while these are common among Native American English speakers, they're often unaddressed in TESOL curriculum. So to be considered a proficient English speaker, especially in the United States, it is crucial that English learners be taught to navigate these nuances of the English language, um, which provide context to the history, complexity, and racial tensions of the United States. Um, and it's important to note that during this presentation, when referring to English, I will be referring to American English. Okay, so the questions posed for this study were, should African American English be included as part of the TESOL curriculum? And which aspects of AAE should be included? So while well, there have been several studies conducted on the benefits of including African American English as part of the general curricula of K-12 schools that have high populations of AAE speakers, it has rarely been examined through the lens of English learners. Um, so the primary research method in this study is a literature review. Um, so it'll re review observations and research done in the field. So I will use eight different research papers surrounding African-American English focused on its history, validity as a dialect and relevance to the US culture and society. Um, and these will be examined and analyzed in order to respond to the research questions posed. So let's start with what is African American English? Um, first off, we should note that it is referred to a couple different names. This includes African American Vernacular English or AAVE, African American English, African American Language, Ebonics, Black English, Black American English. Um, and these are all used in different ways with different contexts. So oh, we won't be getting into the deeper meaning of these here. It's important to understand which ones are used. Uh, for this presentation, I will be referring to it as African American English, um, and you'll understand why here it's not referred to African American vernacular, um, because vernacular is different than a dialect, and here we are posing the support of it as a dialect. So first, we have to look at the differences between AAE and Standard American English, and one of these is its phonological system and morphosyntactic system. Um, so that style shifting variation within the speech of a single speaker included in the linguistic repertoire of an individual speaker constitutes a dialect. And AAVE or AAE contains all the aspectual categories that standard American English does, but also has ones that are not included. Um, so are, for example, the invariant B, remote time bin, um, in AAE, we can mark habituality, whereas uh, white American English vernacular generally requires an adverbial marker. So a good example of this here is the cookie monster question. So in 1998, Janice, Janice Jackson uh, did a study surrounding children and their code switching abilities and their use of both standard American English and American English, African American English. And she showed them a picture of Cookie Monster holding, it's, or Cookie Monster is sick in bed and Elmo holding a plate of cookies um, and giving them to Cookie Monster. And she showed the students this picture and said, who is eating the cookies? Um, and the students responded, Elmo, because Elmo was holding the plate of cookies. 
She then asked, who be eating cookies? To which the students responded, the black student responded, cookie monster. And the student was a speaker of AAE. And he responded with cookie monster because in AAE, there is the habitual B marker. Um, so any kind of speech that can be audibly distinguished as African-American, including both middle-class and working-class varieties is considered AAE or African-American English. So some features of AAE that we're gonna review here um, are things like double modals, might could, might oughta, the absence of the third person singular, um, he run, she walk, he go, possessives in the absence of possessive suffix, ex existentials, um, copula and auxiliary absence, um, negative concord or, or double negatives are commonly used. Um, the use of a first person negative marker like ain't. Um, phonological considerations would be consonant cluster reduction such as coal coffee. Um, the N is substituted for the ing sound. Um, variation of interdental fricatives, uh, arlessness, and suprasegmental features include stress pattern syllables, intonation and rhythm, and syllable timing or length of syllables. And all of these aspects um, constitute essentially the rules and features of AAE, though they are, they do vary um, by regions and, um, you know, across history, generationally, etc. So why is understanding these features important? Um, learning dialectal differences is important to language learning, um, especially with English as such a widespread and nuanced language, treating AAE as a valuable, valuable part of the English language rather than a language deficit um, can deter linguistic prescriptivism and racialization of language, which will in turn affect um, the entire linguistic society and our society. So the racialization of language is something that um, is one of the main purposes of this presentation and, and deterring from that. So Zinnin said in 2021 that African-American English is no more nor less complex, expressive, or systematic than any other dialect of language including standard American English, the dialect commonly used in media, academia, commerce, and government in the US today. And so our society has this ideology that links standard American English with intelligence, credibility, and even moral character. So an example of this uh, would be Rachel Jantel's testimony. And if you are not familiar with Rachel Jantel, she was one of the key witnesses um, in the Trayvon Martin case many years ago that where a young man was killed by police and she as a witness gave her testimony to what happened. And while some analyzed her speech and found that she spoke fluently and completely in AAE with possible influences from Caribbean Creole English. However, the entirely white jury found her language to be hard to understand and not credible. So this brings us to the controversy around Ebonics, also known as AAE. Um, Ebonics is a more politicized term that is a bit outdated, um, but back in 1996, Ebonics was a common term for African-American language. Um, and back in December of 1996, the Oakland, California School Board started to recognize it as the primary language of its majority African-American students. Um, and this was such an important case because it resolved to take into account teaching them standard English or academic English as it was called. And it was one of the first times that African-American English had ever been mentioned as part of educational policy other than in order to eradicate it. Um, so in 1996, with unanimous support of linguists, the Oakland City School Board voted to recognize AAE, or the more politicized term, Ebonics, as a community language for African-American students. And this decision opened up much needed additional funding for those schools and sparked even more debate um, among educational policymakers as to what constitutes a second language, um, what constitutes a deficit, and what constitutes 
English. Um, so this brings us to linguistic prescriptivism. And this is the idea that there is a correct way to use a language. Now, this differs from descriptivism, which is analyzing how speakers use the language and then deducting its rules. Now, prescriptivism can be useful for teaching a language, standardizing the jargon, um, standardizing the style of a particular industry or academic field, or reforming outdated language conventions. However, um, it's a mark of classability and educational privilege. When you gatekeep language and decide that there are rules that make it right or wrong, when language itself is so fluid, you create um, boundaries that don't allow people to learn and grow. And so students need opportunities to build fam familiarity with non-standard dialects. And in this case, um, this dialect is crucial for understanding United States culture and history in regard to racialization of language and racialization of the country. Um, so because of that, this ling linguistic prescriptivism that has surrounded AAE um, is linked with racist, xenophobic, and white supremacist attitudes, as we can see in the case of Rachel Chantel, when the jury simply believed that she wasn't speaking English, even though it was a very credible and real dialect of English. Um, and this leads to disadvantage and discrimination in housing, income, job markets, classrooms, courtrooms, anywhere where standard American English is used outside of the Black community. Um, this creates a disconnect because of linguistic prescriptivism. People are viewing AAE as incorrect rather than correct versus standard dialect. Um, and this is also a reminder that the disdain for things like the double negative or other common features of AAE, um, but double negative is the one example of something that came about in the 18th century. Um, so this is fairly new in the English language that we don't use a double negative and it's very common in many other languages and not seen as a deficit. Um, so it really shows that AAE and other languages or dialects spoken by marginalized groups are historically maligned as broken English and are considered lazy. Um, this is due to colonization and white supremacy and it creates these disadvantages and perpetuates them. Uh, so what makes one system of speech a language? another a dialect, and another disposed, a despised, broken speech is after all subjective and political. Uh, now this quote is very applicable and very relevant today. And so on the left here, you'll see a picture of Rachel Chantal giving her testimony at the Trayvon Martin case, being questioned by a white prosecutor in front of a white jury. Um, and frankly, it makes sense. So we have to look at that and then we compare it to this picture of Princess Charlotte, uh, who already speaks two languages and she's being honored and praised for speaking these two languages. And she should, that is good. But speakers of AAE typically can code switch from one language to another, one dialect to another easily from, from a very young age. And it's seen as a deficit rather than praised. So we need to recognize that. Um, and it's one of the reasons that it should be considered a valid dialect. So why should it be taught and which elements should be addressed? Um, really the purpose of this first study, effects of AAVE on ELL's academic writing, um, this looked at the syntactical features of African-American English and uh, it was to provide a better understanding of how AAE impacted language acquisition of English language learners. And so in this study, D.D. Johnson analyzed writing samples of English language learners that lived in predominantly uh, African-American English speaking areas or communities. And she looked for the influence of AAE features on English learner writing um, in order to determine how dialect impacts their written acquisition of English. And so here, AAE is defined as a dialect with specific rules for form, content, context, and use, uh, which differ from the rules normally seen in a classroom setting and in written English. Um, so the findings indicated a relationship between academic tasks and decrease in AAE usage. Um, so they also noticed a lot of bi or multi-dialectal speakers 
dialect shifting, and code switching. And this proves that students who speak AAE are typically able to code switch or dialect switch between AAE and standard American English. Um, so many are bidialectal. And this often happens with English language learners as well, that they become multilingual or multidialectal. Um, so Pandy in 2000 said that African American English speakers are similar to English language learners when comparing evaluating literacy skills. Um, and it can be postulated that standard American English is actually much like a second language to AAE speakers. Now, this was the case that was made back in 1996 with the Oakland City School Board as well, was that idea of a second language. Um, and while valid and it has been proven, it also needs to be looked at as um, we really need to consider African-American English speakers as bilingual, typically, because they are able to code switch back and forth to standard American English, oftentimes. So the next study was Out of the Hood and Into the News, Borrowed Black Verbal Expressions in a Mainstream Newspaper. So back in 1999, which it should be noted that this study is a bit outdated, um, forms of media were very different in 1999 than they are today. Uh, and while I was not able to find a study to support this, um, I, I would very much speculate that today there's much more influence of AAE in media as we have much, much more media today and social media, especially. Um, but this study looked at newspapers to examine black verbal expressions um, for hi historical eras of origin, linguistic characteristics, original semantics. And, and it found that most of these expressions occurred in the entertainment section, celebrity section and editorial categories. Um, such as comic strips and sports. And what's interesting to note is that these journalists have more expression of freedom and are able and more freedom of word choice and linguistic style where they were using this dialect. So um, borrowings from AAE are fairly cautious and filtered through the stereotypes um, held by mainstream society, thus helping to reinforce the normative function of slang. Um, and this was what was said about the study is that even when AAE was used in these mainstream newspapers, it was filtered through stereotypes. So why should we include AAE in English learning, in English curriculum? It's already there. Um, as Chi Lu says in Black English Matters, it is Black English that has left its mark on popular culture that we participate in, sliding seamlessly into the language of music, art, poetry, storytelling, and social media. It is already a major part of American English. And so to leave it out is to leave out important parts of American English. So what might this look like? Um, so here are some steps towards integrating African-American English into the classroom. Uh, Whitney says that recognition of AAVE in the classroom is not about eradicating the education about the English language. Um, and, you know, we can conclude that it is about growing the education of the English language. So first she says, teacher, educate thyself. You know, if you are a teacher in American English, you need to be well-versed in American English. And this includes all parts of American English and the evidence that we've seen here today includes AAE as an invaluable and important part of American English. Uh, the Linguistic Society of America confirms that distinctive Ebonics pronunciations are all systematic. The result of regular rules and restrictions. They're not random error. And this is equally true of Ebonics grammar. It is a valid dialect not an error. Number two, incorporating multiculturalism into the classroom. Teaching African, or sorry, teaching American English in a multicultural environment means that you need to recognize that American English itself is multicultural and not a monolith. Uh, Geneva Smitherton says that multicultural education is based on the ideals of social justice and educational equity. This includes languages that have been marginalized, racialized in the United States. We have to include them in order to have multicultural classrooms because if we have a monocultural classroom that only includes one type of English, we are not meeting that multicultural need of the students. 
And she also said that true multiculturalism provides students with a more accurate view of Western culture and allows experiences and voices that have been ignored to be heard and appreciated. Uh, multicultural texts serve to connect people of different backgrounds and can be used as a starting point of deeper cultural examination. We want to dive beneath the surface of culture and not to stay on the top of the iceberg. If you've seen that, um, that infographic of the top of the iceberg, like what you know and then what's beneath it is what you need to know, that applies to culture. So three, create a learning environment rich in oral language. This includes exposure to many different accents, dialects, vernaculars, in order to be truly proficient in American English. So this could be a starting point for crucial and truly enriching discussions of relationships among language, knowledge, knowledge, culture, identity, and politics. Um, it creates deeper meaning, understanding, and learning in English learners. Um, it also allows to facilitate discussions. So number four, encourage and demonstrate code switching. Um, this is a good example. You know, it facilitates discussions with students about different linguistic styles and the appropriateness of each one. We dive into pragmatics here. Um, what does this look like in their native language? And, and should, students should understand that cultural contacts influence everything they encounter. So if they're studying in the United States, they have to understand the historical and cultural nuances of the United States. And this includes AAE. And it will help them understand American cultural context. Um, and last but not least, allow students to write like real natives. And while this was included in one of the steps, it should be noted here that um, while incorporating AAE into a TESOL classroom, it should not be incorporated as something that students are using. It should be something that they are familiar with. They should be able to recognize this dialect in text. They should be able to um, incorporate it into their cultural understanding. However, students should not be using this in practice. Um, but what this looks like in a classroom is teaching students how to um, how writing and speaking varies for different audiences. So varieties of English are used to convey information to a variety of audiences. And using different texts can show that um, a character's social status or identity are affected by the language that they speak. And this is something that students should be familiar with. So as integration into TESOL policy, um, there's evidence from multiple studies that AAE is a valid dialect and a vital part of the English language. Learning dialectal differences is important to language learning, especially with a language as widespread and nuanced as English. And treating AAE as a valuable part of the English language rather than a deficit can deter linguistic prescriptivism and racialization of language. And it's leading us to a path to a more inclusive global society. Um, linguistic prescriptivism is this ideology that links standard American English with intelligence, credibility, and even moral character. And if you speak a different dialect, your moral character is seen as lacking. And this is something that needs to change. And this can change in TESOL classrooms and by recognizing that this should be included in education, especially TESOL education. And so TESOL teachers should be proficient in American English in order to teach it. Um, and in order to create multicultural language rich, rich classrooms that allow opportunity for deeper cultural understanding, they need to be proficient and understand all types of American English. So, thank you for your time, and I hope you learned a little something today.